president of the Board of Transnational Institute in Amsterdam and honorary president of ATTAC in France. She has written and thought extensively about globalization and neoliberalism, about, about growing inequality and about poverty in the global world, and about the neoliberal elites, or what she, in her brilliant book from 2010, Whose Crisis, Whose Future, calls the Davos class. Recently, she has also been concerned with the European economical, political and social crisis. Susan George is a radical thinker and activist who is highly respected internationally for her engagement for the poor and for the fight for global social justice. In whose crisis, whose future, Susan George describes the global world as a prison where only a little minority lives outside it. The book analyzes different crises, beginning with the financial crisis, or what she calls the wall of finance. The crises are related to neoliberal globalization and are as such reduced to a system crisis. As Susan George proceeds, the point is that the crises have imprisoned us mentally and physically, and we must break through. We are looking forward to hear more about neoliberal globalization and the crisis it, it has caused, and the possible ways out of it. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Susan George. Thanks very much. Is, is this on? Yes. yes. Um, well, thank you very much. It's, I think the honor really is for me. Uh, LO is, is a model of a trade union, and one which has existed for, for many years. And I think one of the reasons that Norway may escape, probably will escape, some of the crises that I'm going to, to try to describe. <clears throat> anyway, I'm very happy to be here with you all. Um, the, the title is so broad that I can actually talk about anything I like. So um, I, I will try to include as much as I can of the, uh, the crisis that surrounds us, but start by saying, Crisis really is the wrong word. Uh, everybody uses it, I will use it, but a crisis is a, a turning point. A crisis is a crossroads. It's the moment when in an illness you either recover or you die. It, it's, it's a short period, and we are in uh, a, a serial crisis, which has begun in its acute form uh, five years ago, and we're still very far from emerging from it. So I, I don't know what the right word would be, but it certainly isn't a crisis. It's a chronic situation, and it, and it is continuing, and I expect it to continue for a good long time until people organize themselves enough to challenge the forces that are behind it, and which I will try to explain. Um, you have already given some of the beginning of my uh, recent book, which, for which my title is Their Crises, Our Solutions, because I don't like the title in English. It was imposed on me by the publishers, because I think you really can identify a them and an us. Now, I have some disagreements with Chantal on this point, and she will be very welcome to come in and and comment and criticize. Uh, but I think that it is their crises because one can identify a small group, and I'll have a good deal to say about the construction of neoliberalism as an ideology uh, in a moment. But it has been very carefully constructed. It did not fall out of the sky. It's not an accident that the world is enveloped in, now in this uh, ideology. And we find the, the crisis, as I will call it, because that's the word everyone understands, uh, at a whole series of levels which uh, interact. The first one is, of course, financial. I won't go into the reasons for the blow up of the bubbles all over the world, but uh, essentially it stems from deregulation which was engineered by very powerful financial lobbies that got rid of all of the laws that had been put in place during the New Deal 
during the 1930s and the post-war period. All of that architecture of control over capitalism was uh, laid waste, was destroyed. Uh, it is also the product of huge leverage, leverage meaning that you borrow uh, X dollars for one or euros or whatever for one that you possess. I have one dollar that actually exists and actually belongs to me. And I can borrow 30, 40, or 50 uh, other dollars to play with, to speculate with. Uh, and finally, uh, it comes from the banks being merged, which was one of the results of, re of deregulation. The banks were merged into huge units comprising not just ordinary banking, commercial deposit banking, but also investment banking and sometimes other, lots of other financial services into enormous organizations which became, as the slogan has it, too big to fail. And they were too big to fail. Governments were absolutely obliged to save them because if they didn't, that meant that the entire uh, financial architecture went down. They are still repairing Lehman Brothers. They're still trying to find out what happened exactly. And they have discovered thousands of counterparties to whom Lehman owed money or who owed money to Lehman. It, it, this is not a simple situation. So if everything goes down, if one of these, and Lehman wasn't the biggest, <coughs> so one like that, a um, sort of middle-sized, largely investment bank, not a, not a deposit bank, goes down and can cause such havoc. Imagine what happens if there's a whole series. Now here I will interject a, a logical proof, which I didn't have in, when I wrote this, this particular book, which concerns three mathematicians at the Zurich Polytechnic who uh, are uh, students of, and specialists in complexity theory. And I won't go into all of the methodology, but they have uncovered what they call the web of corporate control. And they, starting from a database of 43,000 and some corporations, they've reduced this to 700 and some, which together possess 80% of the entire global economy. And then they reduce that to 140 some, which still possess 40% of the global economy. And then they come to a list in the annex of 50, the largest, most interconnected companies. An interconnected company means that you have relationships <coughs> upstream and downstream from your own business that you have satellites. And the map of these corporations, which they publish, looks like a map of the sky, with huge suns, planets around them, uh, others that are very far out, very dim stars, and then a few supernovae, which are the most enormous in this map, and which have tentacles everywhere. They have connections everywhere. And these mathematicians call the 50 corporations that have the most interconnected relationships. They call this the ninth edge model. Because if the economy is going well, uh, this looks robust. It looks as though it's, it's strong and has good foundations. But if something happens to one of those 50 corporations, the whole thing can go down. It's like dominoes all lined up, which can all go like that and collapse. And it is a knife edge. Now, who are these corporations? Well, 48 of the 50 are financial. They're either banks or financial services, hedge funds, or, or insurance companies. There's only two that are in what we would call the real economy, which are Walmart and the Chinese Petroleum Group. So this gives you an idea of the fragility of, this, of the system that we're working in. And this Norway would not escape. 
Uh, Norway could escape, I think, a good many crises, but not this one, not the financial one, because the interconnection of the payment system is, is and of capital flows is so interconnected that you couldn't miss that. So, the financial crisis is, is a reality. Uh, the banks are still being bailed out, and I'll have more to say about that also. But let's say, let's look at the real economy, where <coughs> real people are working and producing and consuming. The real economy is also in crisis. If you look at the unemployment figures um, for France, that may not seem too serious, 10%, Germany less. But when you get to Southern Europe, and half of the young people are unemployed in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, and 20%, sometimes more, of the adult population is unemployed. And the so-called remedies for the crisis in the real economy are uh, creating more business failures, more contraction of the economy, investors aren't investing, uh, people aren't buying because they haven't any funds, uh, austerity is killing off the uh, entire flows that go through the real economy, uh, and therefore it is to be expected that there will be more contractions because austerity absolutely cannot cure the problem. Mrs. Merkel calls it expansionary austerity. The theory being that this will reassure the financial markets and then they will invest. But this is nonsense. The financial markets, in a very uh, obvious and majority way, are investing in other financial products. Less than 20% now goes into investment in the real economy, and the rest goes from money to money to money to money. You can make money by investing in financial products, which you can sell five or six times, making a profit each time, and absolutely no value of what we would call value has been added uh, to the economy. And this happens every day, and it is organized to happen in that way. So unemployment will continue, it will spread, Europe will uh, contract, uh, and this is not going to change because expansionary austerity is a contradiction in terms. We saw these same policies applied to the South during the entire 1980s and 1990s, and we saw that they, they created uh, a lost decade for Latin America and a, a couple of lost decades uh, for Africa, and it's still going on. Many African countries are still under IMF structural adjustment policies. Then we can look at the crisis also in the area of food and water, which are becoming less and less accessible. This is not a problem in Europe, but it is a huge problem in the South, where there are now, the FAO says, 870 million chronically hungry people, but I don't know how they have reduced that from the billion that there, that there were uh, and that the FAO announced in 2008 because prices had gone up, prices for wheat, rice, uh, corn, uh, and uh, oils had doubled and sometimes tripled and there were 30-some food riots in various parts of the world in 2008. Uh, and today, prices are at the same levels, if not more, than they were at 2008. So I don't know how suddenly these people, the number of hungry, according to the FAO, has been reduced <coughs> back to 870 million. That's their latest figure. But I think it's much higher than that because people are still having to contend with prices for basic staples because their countries are not food secure. They have lost their food sovereignty, if they ever had it, uh, and the uh, ordinary poor person spends 70 to 80% of their income on just on food. So if prices double, you can see easily 
uh, what happens to, to these people. And access to drinking water, to clean water, is becoming more and more difficult. And this is partly, of course, because of the climate crisis, which is the, uh, the last one I'll try to describe very, very quickly. Uh, but the climate crisis, here I think, I mean, the global warming could even be a, a good thing, uh, in quotes, for Norway, because it will make the growing season longer, uh, perhaps it will in increase the tourism season, I don't know, but you are one of the very few countries where this could be uh, a plus. But for nearly everyone else, and particularly the closer you get to the equator, the worse it's going to be, causing out-migration, <coughs> causing conflict over land. This is already starting with land grabbing. You've all heard of the land grabbing movement, which for once is not just uh, the West, but it is also China, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, uh, South Korea, and so on, uh, who are also uh, predators on other people's land, where the peasantry is simply being <coughs> thrown off the land with the complicity of the governments because they don't have formal title in the sense that Westerners would understand title to land. They have traditional farming rights, but rights as understood in their own community. So uh, there is predation, there is, uh, and I'm sure yesterday in your discussion of the Palestinian uh, Israeli conflict, perhaps it was mentioned, but if it wasn't, I'll say it. I mean, a lot of this is about water. A lot of it. And look at the colonies and look at where the reservoirs are. Uh, and you can see an overlay of uh, the colonies are not where they are by accident, they are where they are because there is access to water, which is then uh, drawn off uh, and uh, not available to the Palestinians. So all of this is, is going towards maxi crises, and all, all of this is interlocked. You've seen how the financial crisis contributes to the food crisis. You see how climate contributes to out-migration and to um, competition, brutal competition sometimes over resources. But there are various other uh, interactions that occur between all of these. And in the social sphere, of course, we have greater and greater inequalities, the Gini coefficients. The Gini coefficient, maybe some of you know, don't know about the, uh, the definition. A Gini coefficient is an Italian statistician in the 20s called Corrado Gini who invented this. It's a number between zero and one. And zero is when everyone in the society has exactly the same uh, riches, the share of riches is equally divided. And one is when one person has everything. And of course, both of these cases are impossible. But the lower the Gini coefficient, in the high 20s or lower 30s, that means a pretty equal society. That means a society where the share of wealth, however much wealth there is, uh, is pretty equally shared. And those are generally democratic societies. Not always. You can be dirt poor and not democratic like Kazakhstan and have a low Gini coefficient. But mostly, uh, those countries are like Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, uh, Holland, uh, and, and a few others. And the low 30s is most of Europe, Eastern and Western. But now, those are going up. The US is now at 45 or 46, maybe more. This is, uh, this is a very unequal society. And I believe that the rich, uh, what I call the Davos class, uh, are really seceding from the body politic in many countries. In the US, this is clear. The rich, and, and in Britain, the rich no longer have at all the same interests as the rest of, of the population. And they're, they're seceding from the union. Um, and in the US, there's an unholy alliance with the religious right, uh, where uh, the religious right literally wants to um, get rid of democracy and have a theocratic state. And the rich really don't care, so long as it's an authoritarian state that keeps the people in their place. 
Um, so um, all of all of these all of these um, various crises are interlocking and creating um, a situation in all of our countries in the so-called developed world where we are going to have a, a much more difficult time living together in the future. Growing inequality is, uh, is, is a real threat to social cohesion. And I think that this all comes equally to what we can call a moral crisis or an ethical crisis because the political reaction has been to punish the innocent and to reward the guilty, those who, who created the crisis. And part of this, um, let me say, uh, the organizers know that I'm angry about the Nobel Prize to Europe. And I know a lot of Norwegians think this is a disastrous choice as well. Uh, but why, in particular, am I angry about it? Well, Partly because the, the Constitution, the Lisbon Treaty that was imposed upon us after we had refused in France and Holland uh, the Constitutional Treaty and the Lisbon Treaty is just a clone. It's exactly the same thing. But it obliges us to increase our military spending. Uh, every year you're supposed to increase the military budget. Um, it obliges us to recognize NATO as our over arching uh, military authority, which means the US, basically, because no, uh, no European is ever going to be at the head of NATO, or at the, um, the actual head, because the President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the US forces, as you know. And um, not only does, it have a, 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 does Europe have an impact in the military sphere, but they are waging war against ordinary people in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece, in Ireland, and there will be more to come. Our turn in France and elsewhere will, will, will be coming. Uh, and I don't think you can give a Nobel Prize to people who are every day getting rid of various aspects of democracy while uh, saying that they are in favor of the rule of law and of democracy and saying all the right things, but actually in their practice removing more and more powers, not only from ordinary citizens, but also from parliaments. And the new treaty on so-called stability governance and, uh, and coordination uh, is, is another aspect of that, which will give the power to um, define the budget and approve the budget, take that away from national parliaments and give it to unelected uh, commissioners uh, and, and European central bank personnel, technocrats. So uh, all of this, I think, speaks uh, volumes against uh, giving a Nobel Prize to the European Union at this point. Uh, anyway, let me, let me go on to why I think there really is an attack on democracy and give you some, some proof, some, 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 some specific um, facts that, um, <coughs> that support this view. Um, the austerity plans, I don't think, come out of the sky. This is, this is an invention which has a purpose. And it's not a case of inadvertence. Uh, scholars like Paul Krugman, Joseph Stiglitz, both of them Nobel Prizes in economics. By the way, you know that that Nobel Prize doesn't exist. It's the Reichsbank of Sweden that uh, invented this in 1969. Uh, and they call it in memory of Alfred Nobel, but everybody thinks it's a, it's a Nobel Prize, but it's not. Anyway. They both, these both, uh, these men have both won Nobel Prizes in economics, and they are publishing things like Krugman's latest book, which is uh, Stop This Crisis Now, or Stiglitz, who says Europeans are committing economic suicide, uh, and they believe that the European leadership doesn't understand economics, and they simply don't 
know what policies that they should put in place. And I think that's very naive. It's, this is not a case of inadvertence. It's not that the leadership doesn't know. It's simply that they have chosen these policies for very specific, I believe, specific reasons. It's not a conspiracy. It's a question of interests. And the Davos class has interests, and they are very, they are very solidly uh, together. And that's why I think one can call them a class. They're, inter they're international, of course, but they have similar interests and similar places to meet. And uh, their, their leadership over all of our governments seems to be clearer and clearer. Uh, and you can say that this attack on democracy begins with the, the uh, very origins of the European treaties. I don't go back that far. I don't go back to the 1950s. I think this was developed a lot later. But we can start with 2005, when the French and Dutch votes are refused. Then they do the Lisbon Treaty, which is exactly the same thing. And then the Irish vote against that. And none of these votes count. Uh, the Irish had to vote again. Uh, and we are simply, uh, France and Holland, are simply uh, overwhelmed by because they write a new treaty with a very shadowy group. One doesn't really know how Lisbon got written. But um, they have made an identical treaty. And they are telling us that the people are not going to be listened to. And they have now made free and undistorted competition, which comes back, which came back in the um, constitutional treaty about 25 times, literally. Market was mentioned about six, over 60 times. And now free and undistorted competition has become an objective of the Constitution. It's in paragraph two or three. This is not the sort of thing you put in a constitution. You don't talk about economics. The only other constitution that does that was the Russian one, written by the Politburo in the 1930s. It was the Stalinist constitution. Um, so um, the, 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 the proofs of this are, I think, the first one is that after a major financial crisis, of the kind that hit us in 2007-2008. It would be a normal expectation that the governments really try to do something about this, that they really uh, rush to the head of the queue to introduce new laws, new controls over banks, uh, as Franklin Roosevelt did in the 1930s, the New Deal. Uh, say to the banks, you have to split up, you have to separate, um, and controls over the free movement of capital. None of this happens. There have been no new rules and regulations anywhere in the West. There's the Dodd-Frank bill in the United States, but that is, first of all, not in place yet. It's several hundred pages long, and the financial industry there's plenty of time to get around it. And in Europe, there has been absolutely nothing. No regulations on banks at all. In fact, another proof, the bankers are back in charge. They have received enormous amounts of public money, and they have used it partly to pay themselves the same salaries and give themselves the same bonuses that they had before the crisis, and nobody says anything. Can say against these huge bonuses, but, uh, uh, but no one in power has had anything to say about that. And we now even have Goldman Sachs men in charge in Italy, in Greece, and at the European Central Bank. They call these technocratic governments, but they're not technocratic. They're direct governments by, uh, by financial interests. I don't think when you've spent several years at Goldman Sachs, you suddenly become ideal Democrat. Um, another proof is that financial products have proliferated. Since 2007, derivatives have increased by 25%. Derivatives are the main products that cause the crisis, but they're up 
by fully a quarter over 2007. The same thing with financial transactions. Again, a 25% increase. We're now at $4 trillion a day in financial transactions, currency transactions. $4 trillion is uh, about a third of the GDP, the annual GDP of the European Union. So if you want to multiply that, you could buy some 250 working days, you'll see how many trillions of dollars are exchanged. We might get a transaction tax, not the one that attack wanted, but we might get a transaction tax now. And that could do some good, but I think that they would probably just put it in their uh, in their budgets rather than sharing it. Our idea was a third for repairing the social systems in the north, another third for help to the south, and another third for mitigating climate change and, and green transition. But that is clearly not going to happen. Another proof is that the high net worth individuals, as they are called by Merrill Lynch in its annual World Wealth Report, have never been so numerous or so rich. These approximately 10 million people in the world, that is the size of greater Paris, together have a fortune of 42.7 trillion, which is three times the GDP of Europe or the United States. It's also three times the, the uh, public debt of the United States. And these people can use another one of the proofs, which is they have really easy access to tax havens. There was some activity on tax havens in 2009 when the G20 said we will get rid of these secrecy jurisdictions and so on. Nothing has happened. There was an initial flurry because they were a little bit frightened then, but they're not anymore. Come tax havens uh, and the free flows of capital, particularly being pulled out of the south, uh, are, uh, are on the increase as well. And finally, it is clearly decided that the ordinary people are going to pay for this crisis. The bankers have not had to contribute anything. The traders have not been called upon. The banks have not been separated and so on. So I think you know, we can really say that, that, that we can prove this. And that the leadership understands perfectly well what it is doing. The next thing it is on its list is to attack all of the gains of workers, of working people over the last 50 or 60 years. And I'm, I don't know what your experience of that has been at LO. I hope you will say something about that in the discussion. By the way, I'm allowed to go on how long? Five more minutes, oh my god, I'm not anywhere near that. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, look, then I will, I, will, I will speed up. I will speed up, but I would like to say that I think that there are two clashing models. There are two clashing intellectual models. One of them is the neoliberal model, which is not an accident, which was very carefully constructed from the, 19, um, the 1950s onwards. It is the product of ideas which were developed, particularly beginning at the University of Chicago by Friedrich von Hayek, an, ex an exiled Austrian, uh, who ended up in Chicago. One of his star students was Milton Friedman. Um, they founded together the Mount Pelerin Society, which is a, a, a me an, an annual meeting where all of the elite uh, neo liberal economists meet, Margaret Thatcher being one of them, and where uh, they have, through a very well thought out program of developing think tanks, publications, university chairs, sometimes university departments such as law and economics, which didn't exist uh, previously, uh, and who have consciously set out to change the ideological landscape. They know that ideas have consequences. And they had a few gurus on the right who thought through these ideas and convinced 
of some major fights. And so what would be very helpful is that unions can say to the ETUC, you know, we are very much in favor of this process. But we have quite a few individual unions that are already integrated into it. This comes out of a, uh, um, an earlier movement called the Joint Social Conference, which uh, was mostly trade unions, but a few social movements. But now uh, it is trade unions, but it's also the attacks of Europe, uh, Greenpeace Europe, uh, with all its individual branches, um, the Indianados, who are not really structured, but who send people. Um, we have relationships with political parties, but it is not the political parties that are uh, writing the agenda. It's the social movements. Um, so we have people from Syriza in Greece, but we don't. Uh, but we also have research institutes like TNI, like Unicos Volantus, Volantus Institute in Greece, etc. So I, I think it, it's it's happening, and you're absolutely right about the rise of fascism, which was perfectly predictable. I mean, we know that that's what happens when people are out of work. We know that that's what happens when um, they have no um, place of refuge, and uh, as the Muslim Brotherhood does, they, they take over whole neighborhoods because they provide services to people that people can no longer provide for themselves. And that's what the Golden Dawn is doing. They, uh, my Greek friends tell me they've taken over whole neighborhoods in, in Athens, uh, and probably elsewhere. And so, you know, this is to be expected. And unless we can counteract that, um, it will continue to grow. So, I'm being perfectly pragmatic about all of this, you know, whether, whatever the, uh, and, and I do believe we are losing a lot of cohesion also for the same reasons that you, that you expressed. Then I can't see any more people who wants to ask questions. Nobody else? Com comments? Criticism. <laughs> Okay, dear Susan, Susan George, thank you very much for coming to us and sharing, sharing with us. We, we want to give you a little gift. No way. In spite of all of this, there was an enlightenment model. 
an ideal type based on democracy, based on human rights, based on individual freedom and human emancipation, which inspired the fight against slavery, which inspired uh, the women's rights movement, the equality movement, of racial equality, inspired public services, care for the weak and the, um, those who could not care for themselves, uh, decided that human rights were universal and that they were of all times and for all peoples everywhere, um, supported the arts and the sciences and the sciences, said church and state must be separate. You know, you know these values, but these values are all being challenged by the neoliberal model. Uh, and they are um, exactly the opposite. They believe that freedom, as Milton Friedman says, freedom is the freedom to choose among economic solutions, that um, charity is okay to take care of the weak, but it should not be a state function. Hayek said that, the, uh, that there is no uh, theoretical reason that the rich should pay to ensure education for the children of the poor. Uh, private enterprise is always better than public on grounds of efficiency, quality, availability, price, you name it. Private is always better than public. Uh, democracy is choice, and therefore it's better to have private schools with a voucher system so parents can choose where to send their children. Um, and that the market should be making the decisions because the market is supreme. Uh, so you see that the, that the whole movement to reduce taxes, uh, to remove support from the public sphere, to destroy social cohesion, to say that you are responsible for your own fate and if you don't have a successful life and if you're not rich, it's your own fault because you didn't work hard enough. This was constructed uh, it was it was wanted, and they are still constructing it. Uh, and I would so I would like to take three minutes to say what can we do about all of this? Aside from the obvious solutions such as socializing the banks, financing a green transition, having European-wide bonds which can help to finance those uh, undertakings, public undertakings that no state, however powerful, not even Germany, can do by itself. Uh, and a genuine green transition, by which I do not mean uh, an, an ecological takeover by the private sector, which is, seems to be the only plan now after Rio. Those are the obvious things to do. And have a, have a European Central Bank that lends to states and not to the banks, which then lend to states at high interest rates. But I don't think that, that there is a hope for any of us unless we're organized. I never discourage personal involvement, but uh, I don't think that individualism is enough to solve the, the crisis that we are in. And unless Europeans, and I realize much of this may seem irrelevant to Norway because you're not a member of the EU, but you do have a certain amount of fallout does affect Norway. Uh, the, what, the only solution that I see now is to bring trade unions and social other social movements closer together and capable of acting together. And this is something that I am engaged in at a very personal level now uh, because with some trade unionists from uh, France and Belgium in particular, we uh, saw that there had been 25 or 30 appeals in Europe, all saying more or less the same things, all saying no to austerity, uh, control the banks, get finance under control, all with the same social and political demands, save democracy, and so on. And we condensed the, these various statements into one call which is the call of the Alter Summit, which you can read at uh, altersummit.eu. And 
any organization that agrees with this call is really invited to join the Alter Summit process. We now have about 100 organizations that are in it, and it's a European-wide effort. And we do have one representative from Norway on the coordinating com uh, committee, which is the U.S. House Ron Bauer, which some of you probably know, and has written widely on public services and so on. Uh, and our objective is in three weeks' time, no, a couple of weeks' time, in Florence, in, where the Italians are organizing a 10th anniversary conference with the first European Social Forum called Firenze Dieci Più Dieci, Florence Plus 10, looking 10 years into the future also. Uh, we will have our official launch there. Then we hope to have a European-wide day where we can be visibly all saying the same basic things and trying to get ourselves heard in Brussels, where we are not heard. We're not listened to by the Commission, the Central Bank, uh, certainly not uh, by the IMF. And we then hope to have an altar summit, which can be several altar summits. We don't know what the future will be, but probably in one of the most effective countries, Greece or Spain, uh, in order to have uh, a common charter that goes beyond the call and so on. So I would encourage you to look at that. I would encourage LO uh, to, to examine this and to see if it is relevant uh, to, to their own concerns, because it seems to me, unless we are united against the Davos class, uh, they are going to win. So in conclusion, I would like to quote Warren Buffett, who is, as you know, probably the third largest fortune in the world, who said, there's class warfare, all right, but it's my class, the rich class, that's waging the war, and we're winning. And I think he got it right. So take him seriously and see what we need to do in the future together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then we open up for questions and uh, comments. We'll do it at the same time. Uh, last time, we come up here. Any questions? Any comments? Comrades, uh, I would. Uh, I, I, can, uh, I think it's an interesting idea. This, uh, this cooperation between trade unions and maybe as also a representative of the old left and the social movements, but uh, in many cases also represents the new left yeah. to uh, work together. Uh, towards the neoliberalist uh, that's actually also I think is an union uh, or unification of the old political right wing and the business sector, the big business and also the charity industry is a part of it. Um, one thing, um, one concept uh, um, I have had some discussions with um, uh, younger party members of my party here in Norway is that actually, as a socialist, I do not identify myself as a person that do politics because of goodwill. I do it because of interest. And the way I say this is, for a society to, in the long run, uh, to be a good society, it needs to have a certain security for its people and also lift people together. And here I think there is very important to reflect upon that actually meaning that we cannot let people go without work, without any hope for the future. Then of course they will start to turn into desperate movements or desperate people 
I would experience myself. In extreme situations, people tend always to listen to the one that has a solution. In Germany in the 1930s, this only person was Adolf Hitler. He was the only one that believed uh, that they, uh, or said that he could help and bring Germany back on uh, track. And this solution he presented was fascism. And um, today we see it in Hungary with Jopik, we see it in Greek, and we see it in many places. And I think it's very important to have this working together because I feel also in the old left, and maybe more particularly also in the new left, there is a tension towards each other. We think in one way, we have big congresses, we like very strict rules we like, to, uh, uh, wear a gray suit, walk up and speak to a crowd like this. Other groups, um, new groups are much more informal. They are organizing via Facebook or Twitter. They are have, speaking a different language than we are. And my question is, how can we overcome this gap between the old and the new left so we can actually work together? Well, uh, I think this is happening. Um, if, if what you call the old left, if that means trade unions, I can tell you that this is happening because uh, we've got Indianados and we've got the CGT in France, the CGIL, uh, the C CSS in Belgium, um, and uh, it seems to be working. You know, I mean, what one thing which would be extremely helpful is that the members of the European Trade Union uh, um, conference, co 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 anyway, uh, Congress, the, 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 the uh, European um, Central Union of European Unions, which is coming as an observer to our meetings at the Alter Summit, but can't do things that they're own members uh, are, are